Welcome back to Radio 54. Now, we simply had to start this week's show with this story. And what a story it is. I fucking love this guy. This guy just said, fuck it. I'm going to propose to a sex doll. Yes, that's right, a sex doll. Now, he could have done this for publicity or maybe just maybe has, he's batch crazy. But we decided to put this into video format for you. Actually, we ripped it off YouTube, but it's kind of a life's journey kind of thing. My darling, I can't get up your love, babe. A story of love and latex. And wait, wait, wait just a minute. Is it just me or does this non-human sex doll actually look miserable in this picture? You have to be pretty sad and pathetic for a sex doll to literally frown when you touch her or try to kiss her. I mean, how bad can it be? But I guess that's why this sad sack of shit is marrying a sex doll. Now, brother, if you happen to be one of the tens of people that actually watch this shit, please, please hit me up on Farid at MuslimMusu.com and let's vibe a bit. I got to know about you and your latex lover. Now, I recently discovered the most searched Google term in Kenya in January was, get ready for this, Samantha the sex doll. Yes, that's right. Samantha the sex doll topped the Google search for January in Kenya. In a time when we basically had two presidents, a national resistance movement, and a disappearing Kamba. Samantha the sex doll was actually more popular. More popular on the search engine Google. Which goes to tell me two things. We finally had enough of no good <laughs> lazy civil servants dictating how we should live our lives, or we're just sick lazy civil servants dictating how we should live our lives. Either way, we've come a long way as a people. And maybe, just maybe soon enough, we'll have more happy unions like this one. Well, not this one, but you get the picture. Speaking of sex dolls, I'd like to discuss the state of football in Kenya. And that was the world's worst segue. It's quite obvious that there are problems in the realm of the beautiful game here. And yes, we are sh and the team is sh and the coaches with the exception of, and this is my opinion, Reinhard Fabisch and Francis Kimanzi have been sh the real problem is the running of football. So we thought getting rid of this clown would solve our problems. Then we bring in this young, charismatic, cool, hip, and no-nonsense clown, and shit doesn't change. So Paul Putt became Harambe Stars coach in mid-November 2018. And this is Paul Putt, not this Paul Putt, who was a Cambodian murderer and ethnic cleanser. I'm talking about Paul Putt. So he became the Kenyan national football team Harambe Stars head coach three months ago. And three months after he stepped, and three months later, rather, he stepped down as the coach of the Kenya national football team, Harambe Stars. And then the Federation thanks him for his unwavering support and dedication and wishes him all the best in his future endeavors, which I love because no one ever means that, especially if you lasted three months. Have you ever gotten that letter? The one where that says, we wish you all the best in your future endeavors? Have you ever gotten one of those letters? So you know what it actually means? It means you, you loser. It's not someone telling you that you were really good and that it was really tough to let you go. It means that you're the dumbest in the room and you'll, have, and you'll never have much luck with your future endeavors. That's what it means. Sorry, can we just go back to Colonzo for a minute? I mean, how sexy is this dude? He can literally pull off any style, any style at all. There's the pensive Colonzo. <laughs> there is, I just farted Colonzo. <laughs> There is, I will always be on your side, Colonzo. We are one family. There is, and guess what, William? I'm not gonna show up to the inauguration, Colonzo. Don't be surprised at all. And then there is this Colonzo. It's like playing the game, where's Waldo? We can play, where's Colonzo? Of course, I know it's all old news and we're waiting for what his next move will be, but we have to go back and look at some of the best Colonzo memes. I tell a man's not hot, man's not. I tell a man's not hot, never hot. The girl told me, take off the jacket. I said, babe, man's not hot, never hot. I tell a man's not hot. I tell a man's not hot, never hot. The girl told me, take off your jacket. I said, babe, man's not hot. Man can never be hot, never hot. Perspiration. Now, let's talk NGO, shall we? Now, in my days on radio, I was quite vocal about how I felt about NGOs, about how all they do is sweet f while driving nice big cars and living in the tree-lined avenues of Nairobi's sexiest upmarket neighborhoods. But what is the reason they're here? To eradicate waterborne diseases or to create a safe space for a safe space for abused women or to get the street kids off the streets into safe places. And look, I'm not suggesting that there are no NGOs doing good things. No, not at all. What I am suggesting is that there are some NGOs and aid workers that should be taken out back and shot. Think about it. Is it in their interest to solve the problems that they came here to solve? I mean, if an NGO manages to remove street kids from the streets, 
then what happens to that job or those jobs? Solve one crisis and then go home. That would be a perfect world. Do they want to move back to their little lives in small town America with one car for a family of five? Or do they want to stay here in Kenya in a five bedroom mansion and drive like assholes on the road because they have a red plate, knowing that they can't be with because they have a police force dedicated to them alone. So why are they here? Well, in the UK, shockwaves from a sex abuse scandal are hitting Oxfam hard and fast. Oxfam's deputy chief has resigned after a prostitution scandal involving aid workers. Now to a story we're following, the British government could stop giving money to the aid agency Oxfam after a sex scandal in Haiti. Oh, right. It's all for the... No, I'm not making light of a very serious conversation here. I am saying that the whole NGO aid worker culture needs to be looked at, it needs to be dissected, and it needs to be reevaluated. Because you may say this is happening in Haiti, so it doesn't affect us here on the dark continent, but it does. Because according to the Mail Online, aid workers traded wheat, medicine, and oil for sex with girls as young as 13 and made them pose naked for pictures in a West African scandal. Yes, that's right. Wheat and life-saving medicines for sex with children in crisis zones, it has emerged. Now, we are not saying in any way that every NGO functions like this, but we are saying, according to reports, that it happens with some NGOs in some areas. What kind of despicable human being would take advantage of a situation where people are starving, in need of aid and support, and say, yeah, I can help, but there's something I need from you? This kind of despicable human being. Let me read you the Oxfam purpose statement. This is on their website, and I would have probably removed it if I were Oxfam at this point in world history. It reads, and I quote, our purpose is to help create lasting solutions to the injustice of poverty. We are part of a global movement for change, empowering people to create a future that is secure, just, and free from poverty. Hey, Oxfam, go f yourself. And if you're an aid worker or NGO with an earshot of me, and you've been involved in some bullshit like this, close to it, or even thought about it, the world is now watching, and so are we at Radio 54. Have a great week ahead. Mariam is up next, and boycott Oxfam. Thank you very much, Farid. Most of our viewers will be glad to know that sex doll proposals aren't the only exciting thing that's been happening. A certain bug seems to be traveling across the continent. First, it came for good old Uncle Bob, and we said, you know what, Bob's older than the civil rights movement. His immunity just isn't what it used to be. And we forgot about that. Then, the bug came for Jay-Z, full-time rapper and dancer, and sometimes acting president of South Africa. If we're being honest, this was long overdue. But who knew the ANC would have the balls to ask Jacob Zuma to vacate his office? Jay-Z's reaction, however, is the interesting part. At first, former President Zuma refused to resign until the ANC told him exactly what he did wrong. Well, just in case you forgot, we put together a little video of things Jay-Z has done over the years that may have sent South Africans over the edge. A showreel of sorts. Let's have a look. Scandal once again surrounds South African President Jacob Zuma. He's under fire over his links to the influential Gupta family. African leader Jacob Zuma is forced to deny he let a family of wealthy industrialists hand out positions in his cabinet. And no ordinary scandal, a mountain of newly leaked emails has helped expose what many believe is a criminal plot to capture the state itself. <laughs> speaking to the workers, uh, it became very clear that they had a very different narrative. It's the house that cost the South African state over $20 million, and it could cost President Zuma millions of votes in the country's upcoming election. Equally interesting was the reaction of many South Africans to the resignation. Have a look at this poor reporter who was just trying to get comments from random folks and couldn't find anyone to talk about Zuma without using expletives. He must just go. He's just a Well, gee whiz, that's a uh, quite strong language uh, for live television. Guys, any thoughts on President Jacob Zuma's resignation? Fuck him. All right, well, well, um, We'll have to leave it at that for the moment, uh, Kathy. If you thought the resignation bug was done with its continental travels, you thought wrong. East Africa had to get some love too. Ethiopia's Prime Minister Haile Mariam Deselen resigned barely 24 hours after Jacob Zuma. While South Africa has got a new president, Ethiopia has lost its Prime Minister. 
Appearing on state TV at noon local time, Haile Mariam Dasani has confirmed he has submitted a letter of resignation to leave his post as the chair of the ruling EPRDF party and prime minister of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. In a televised address, Haile Mariam Dasani said his resignation was vital for achieving the changes necessary for sustainable peace and democracy in Ethiopia. He resigned in a bit too, and I quote, end years of political upheaval and unrest. Now I know you're thinking, what years of political upheaval and unrest? I never hear a peep coming out of Ethiopia. But that's because Ethiopia is an extremely closed off country with limited freedom of speech and access to information and even less media freedom. However, what the country does excel at is great PR. That's why all you ever see about Ethiopia is a picture of the lovely clean Addis next to the steaming hot pile of garbage that is Nairobi, or a picture of their shiny electric train next to our diesel run fossil. In reality, hundreds of people have died in anti-government protests that began in 2015 in a bid to tame state corruption. In fact, last year, the country spent 10 months in a state of emergency. Yes, 10 months, and most of the rest of the world didn't have a clue. The question for Ethiopia now is what next? Will the Soviet-style rule and crackdown on dissent continue, or will reform be the new agenda for the gorgeous country that, despite the circumstances, is experiencing phenomenal economic growth? We wait and see. So as it stands, Kenya has two presidents, Ethiopia has none, and the biggest conundrum of all is which African leader will Trevor Noah make fun of now? Jacob Zuma, unlike the rest of us, doesn't conform. He doesn't conform to the norms, you know? doesn't conform to the laws of grammar and punctuation as we mere mortals. No, no, not our president. Comma, for who? For you, maybe, not me. Jacob Zuma was supposed to be the craziest president South Africa ever had. It was the only reason I voted for him. It was his madness, and look at him, he's come in, and he wears a tie and a suit, he stopped singing. He's got a cabinet that looks like they know what they're doing. He's gonna fight corruption, and he even fired Manto Shabalalam Simang. <laughs> I was expecting a madman, a crazy guy, someone who was just gonna throw the country away. And look who I got, someone who's actually doing their job. I can't believe it. Once again, the ANC has failed to deliver. But now, President Zuma has gotten himself into another bind. In South Africa, the country's president, Jacob Zuma, is facing calls to resign. This after South Africa's highest court determined Zuma broke the law in using public funds to renovate his private home. The Constitutional Court ruled Mr. Zuma improperly used $15 million in state funds for home upgrades. <laughs> you know what I love is people looking at that going, which one is his home? All of it. What you were looking at was all of it. Yeah, President Zuma spent $15 million to renovate his house, not build it, renovate, which is an amazing figure, partly because he can't even count that high. Since we're on the subject of bugs in Ethiopia, did we all just skip over the WikiLeaks-style reveal that China bugged the AU headquarters in Addis while they were being constructed? The bugs were allegedly discovered when IT engineers noticed that their computer servers peaked between midnight and 2 a.m. and that the servers were connected to others in Shanghai and were sharing information. Some reports even claim that microphones were found embedded in the seats. So why is there no outrage? Why are Chinese ambassadors not being summoned to foreign affairs ministries all over Africa? Is it because we know that beggars can't be choosers? We always knew that China's investment in Africa would come at a cost. We just assumed that the cost would be the ridiculous interest rates we pay. But alas, our Chinese friends want to know what we're up to when they're not with us. They are a rather insecure partner, but we have to stick it out in this relationship because we are in too deep. That's because China has also financed parliament buildings in Malawi, Lesotho, the Seychelles, and Guinea-Bissau. It's set to finance parliament buildings in Zimbabwe and the DRC in the next few years. In East Africa, one out of every four development projects is financed by the Chinese. That is the hole we have dug ourselves into. And also the answer to the question, who owns Kenya, who owns Africa? Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.